Hello, yes, that's right. It's Joe here live for Joyrider TV. Yes, uh, back with some more scintillating Q&A where I am going to be attempting to answer your most challenging questions. If you've got some challenging questions, then yes, I'll have a go at answering them. OK, so um, the big news, there's always some big news on Joyrider TV. And today is certainly without exception. Yes. Yeah, so the big news, uh, this is the first announcement of this big news. A lot of you have been asking when would be the right time to come out to Wild Wind Sailing Holidays for a special week of Joyrider TV goodness. Well, I can tell you right now, it's just been announced. Hold on. I'm just going to get a calendar. Uh, let's have a look on the calendar just to make sure this is correct information. Yes. So time to come out would be the weekend of the 15th or 16th of July, where that week, are you ready for this? I don't know if you are. Um, we're going to be having the Wild Wind Joy the TV Festival of Speed. Oh, yes, we are. Um, so it's basically going to be like a condensed speed stick for one whole week where um, everybody gets a GPS on their boat, goes out, sends it as hard as they can and um, sees how fast they can go. Doesn't this sound like a great idea? Yes, I think it does. And I think there's also a plan to do a second one towards the end of August as well. So there you go. You heard it here first. The Festival of Speed at Wild Wind Sailing Holidays, uh, 16th of July for that week. Come out here, get involved, get on the Speed Festival stick, whatever we're going to call it. Uh, there'll be prizes. There'll be all sorts of things going on. There'll be the chance to hang out talk about fast sailing, stuff like that. So there you go. I think that is a very exciting start to today's proceedings. All right, just saying hello to everyone who's checking in. Hello to Mark in Northern Ontario, Canada. Great to have you with us. Hello, Christian. It seems like I just saw you a few minutes ago. Uh, thanks for tuning in. Um, hello to Michael. From the southern tip of Lake Michigan, Indiana. Great to have you on board. Hello to Lowell in South Africa, Cape Town, I believe, or thereabouts. Yeah, great to have you with us, man. Uh, we've got Lincoln with us as well in Nova Scotia, Canada. Uh, thanks for tuning in. Um, always nice to be hitting uh, the corners. Uh, talking of the corners. Also, we've got... Um, I'd like to say, currently leading the getaway fleet on the speed stick. Uh, we've got Declan, but I'm not, I wouldn't be surprised if where Declan is in Sweden, it's still a little bit chilly for putting the getaway in the water. Perhaps Declan is still wearing the ice skates at this time. Um, speaking of the speed stick, all right, I have to ask. What is going on right now? Because it has been very slow on the speed stick, perhaps slower than ever. There have been very few entries to the speed stick so far. Everybody just waiting for that big day where they can charge before getting on the stick. If that sounds like what you're doing, if you've, if you've gone out with a GPS, even if you've got what seems like not the biggest speed, then get it logged on the speed stick so then you can notch it up later. Um, I don't know if this is totally clear, but you can have as many entries to the speed stick as you want. So say you're um, somewhere in Canada sailing a Hobie 16 with a kite as a engine then you can get on the speed stick on your first run out. And after a year, when you're really good at it and much faster, 
you can have as many entries to the stick as you like. So get involved. Get on the stick. There's still no getaways on the stick. And after the getaway prize has been announced as a stick for winning the stick, I think you never know. There might be no more wind for the rest of the year. So if you can get out this weekend, um, get out this weekend, GPS, get on the stick. You could win the stick. Getaway sailors. Oh, yes. So anyway, that was just um, uh, why is nobody getting on the stick part of this transmission? All right. Who did I say hello to? All right, we've got D Burden 83. Oh, David in Toronto. I think we are definitely Canada heavy at the moment. Uh, welcome to everybody in Canada and everybody in the rest of the world. Thanks for tuning in. Yeah, Christian agrees. A lot of Canadians here. Uh, so Dave, David in uh, Toronto says too cold here for the Hobie 18 to splash in at this time. All right, Declan is excited about the Festival of Speed, and so you should be. Yes, there's going to be some big speeds that week. Uh, and, you know, anywhere else you'd think, well, as long as the wind does the business, well, that, that is the, the great thing about Vasiliki Lefkus, Greece. The wind is well known as good at doing the business. All right, we've got Thorn G on board. <laughs> He says, Be beware of me because I will bring a question again. Great stuff. All right. Declan says, early doors for the Northern Hemisphere sailing season. Still snowing here in Stockholm. The winter just won't quit. All right. We've got Angel on board. Thanks for tuning in. Great to have you with us. Not sure if you've tuned in before. So um, always nice to welcome a new name to the live Q&A. Greetings from Jalisco, Mexico. Can you tell me if the delaminations in the hulls of an old Hobie 14 that I bought affect its navigation or safety? This is a very good question. OK, so if you've got a boat, that's a good start. The way to see if it is delaminated is this softness, which we speak about quite a lot. If you um, on the deck of the boat, let's do the deck first and give it kind of a bit like CPR, really push it, um, you know, maybe every 15 centimetres or so, give it a push down in the middle of the deck. And if it moves inwards more than a very, very small amount, that is quite a good sign that there is some delamination going on inside the hull or in the the layers that make up the deck of the boat as you move backwards keep trying it uh, a common place for delamination in the deck of your hobie 14 16 or any other catamaran for that matter is just in front of the front beam this is quite this is a place that gets quite a lot of stress um, from when if you're sailing in waves at all, uh, this is quite a stressed part of the hull. The other part of the hull, which not on the 14 so much, but on a boat which doesn't have a raised trampoline, uh, the bit of the hull where you actually sit, this is likely to become soft before the rest of the deck. Um, so firstly, let's just continue with the deck as a start. So is this affecting the safety possibly um if the area which is delaminated is quite small like um the size of your hand that would i'd consider that to be a small area then it's not going to affect the safety of the boat at the moment but what could happen is that bit the size of your hand could start to get bigger and if it becomes the size of say um, a dinner plate of softness on the deck, then this is really becoming a significant issue. And the reason that a soft deck, uh, that's deck, uh, will become 
a safety concern is because if the deck becomes soft, then what might happen next could be quite dramatic uh, because the deck is what is giving the whole hull its stability. So um, what would happen if your deck, that's deck, got too soft and you sheet in hard is you could actually fold the hull in half because the deck isn't supporting the bow of the boat anymore. Now, this would be quite alarming. And yes, it could affect your safety if you are sailing out to sea. So if you have got a soft bit on your deck, that's deck, uh, the size of your hand, then uh, get it sorted out. So you could either try uh, doing this injecting uh, injection um, of epoxy into the deck. I did make a video on this, I think the year before last. Um, you could either do that or just take it to a boat builder to fix that soft part of the deck. Uh, the same thing goes for the sides of the hulls. Again, go along the sides of the hulls, pushing them to see if they move. And this could be just as bad, actually. Same sort of um, scale, size of your hand. You'll probably be all right for a bit. But don't leave it like that. Get it sorted out before it spreads to a wider area. Um, because if the side of the hull loses its structural integrity, then what can happen is it can actually split um, because there's a lot of pressure on the side of the hull. If you think if you're flying a hull like this, then here, a lot of pressure in there. Um, and the hull can split. And even though pretty much all catamaran hulls that we talk about here have got some internal foam buoyancy, even though they've got that, they're not going to, if the hull is completely filled with water, it is, you know, the boat isn't going to sink completely, but it is going to be a very, very difficult situation to recover from there we go okay just have to ask at this time uh how's my lighting today just put in some new lights um i can't see the difference from where i'm sitting uh waste of money okay um martin from melcheski composites is on board yes that's right that's martin who makes these very very nice tiller extensions i've had actually martin i've had a request if um ryan who sails uh the boat honeycat wins the stick are you able to make a tiller extension in black and yellow there's the question so martin can i'm pretty sure make uh these sweet tiller extensions to your specification uh, so that, I think, is a very good question to put the other way. Um, very good. All right. So David in Toronto, he's got a question. My forestay and side stays are quite old. How do I know if I should replace them? I think uh, your, your, the way you've written the question says it all. I think you should replace them. If they are quite old, that I would guess means that they are more than five years old which I would say replace them the only time if I was um sailing in the real world uh with my own boat the only time I wouldn't be replacing the rigging every five years is if I was doing the majority of my sailing on quite a small body of water like a fairly small lake where you know if the mast comes down you're going to be blown onto the shore fairly quickly but the thing is if your mast falls down there is always the possibility that it's going to cause damage to another part of the boat uh, on a bigger boat like an f-18 or something if your mast falls down um, you could damage the trampoline uh, you could damage the mainsail, uh, the battens. Uh, it could hit the hull. You could damage the hull. Um, all sorts of things. So 
I'd say if your rigging is more than five years old, it's time to replace it. And what we're talking about there is replacing the forestay and the shrouds and the bridle wires. If um, if the way your boat rigs has a what we might call a pigtail, which is the short like strop like piece of rigging, usually up by the mast, replace that one as well. What we find here is these short pigtails, they break much more regularly than the longer lengths because uh, as a percentage of that piece of rigging, it's got more going on. It's got these the two end things, not much in between. The bit in between isn't usually the issue. It's where the fittings are on the ends. This is where rigging is generally going to break, I would say, 99.7% of the time. That's where it's going to break. So, yes, replace them, Dave. Um, okay, we've got on e Mickey on board. Mickey from Japan. Great to have you with us, Mickey. Always nice to be speaking to people in Japan. Uh, Mickey is restoring an old Hobie 16. The mast has two mast tangs. The classic with three holes. And under that one, there is a smaller one with one hole. Do you know this configuration? No. This is absolutely new for me. Um, so, no, I have app. I've never seen one like that. So what Mickey is saying, mast, usually we would have a mast tang like that with, uh, well, this is a hot topic right now because we, we have been looking at the new global standard Hobie 16s. I'm actually just in the process of putting a comparison and review of the changes video together. Hopefully that will be out on Sunday. Um, and on the new global standard, the mast tang is more like on the Hobie Tiger, where it has uh, three holes in it, maybe like what Mickey has. Um, so maybe Mickey's boat is ahead of the game because it's already doing what the new boats are doing. But having a second mast tang, so what has he got? The classic with three holes, and under that there's a smaller one with one hole. So if you've got this three-hole tang, and then something like this. Yeah, that is, I would guess that somebody has done that uh, for some reason. Don't know what that reason might have been, but um, yeah, just use the one with three holes, I would say. But if you really want to be sure, Mickey, you can send me an email with a photograph of what you've got going on there. And I will let you know exactly what it is that I would do in that situation. There we go. All right. We have got on board Life on the Edges. Yes, that's Ollie Smith of the Wild Wind team. He is currently at Alex's Pizza, probably with a beer in hand. All right. I am not jealous at all, I have to say. Um, do check out Ollie's uh, channel called Life on the Edges, where there's some really nice clips of sailing from Wild Wind Sailing Holidays. Um, and there will be a lot more there in the coming weeks. I can tell you that once we're on the water. Very nice. All right, we've got Mr. Tony KP. Hello from Ebeltoft, which is in Denmark, I could tell you. Uh, the Danish flag there is the giveaway. All right, we've got Valentin on board. Hello, Valentin. Thanks for tuning in. I believe we have a question here. I installed my new spinnaker on my Tiger, but the rope coils on itself when I sail, when I raise the sail at the top two or three meters with about a dozen turns on it, new boat and we, new rope and we stretched it. Hmm. Yeah, this is, 
This does happen sometimes. And sometimes it appears to happen for no good reason. Um, so what Valentin is saying is when he's pulling his spin spinnaker up, when it's getting close to the top, it's just spinning. It's starting to twist and probably twisting the top of the spinnaker, which is a pain. Uh, so what can be done about that? All that I can suggest without actually being there and seeing it is taking the spinnaker halyard off the boat again and just tying one end of the spinnaker halyard to something and then just running your hands along the halyard all the way and just pulling it, which if it has got any natural twists in the rope, then that should get those twists out. What you could also do is when you then put the spinnaker halyard back onto the boat, uh, you could put it on the other way round so the top becomes the bottom and the bottom becomes the top. And maybe that will fix the problem. What you could also do, you could do all this uh, the best way and to save you the most time, I would do it with the boat on its side. So tip the boat over on land first. Uh, have a look at the halyard, take it off, give it a good run along, maybe with a glove on and just run your way along the whole halyard, just pulling some tension on it. Um, also look at how the blocks are running at the top of the mast and everywhere else, all of the other blocks that influence the spinnaker going up well worth a look there as well. Um, and then hopefully that will have, um, he does say he stretched the rope already, which is leaving a baffled expression. But um, yeah, I would um, go for that for a start. And what you could do actually with the boat on its side is then once you've done all that, as long as you've got quite, if you can have a boat on its side on grass, that would be the nicest because then what you could do is hoist the spinnaker with the boat on its side and just have one person hoisting it, and one person watching exactly what's going on at the top as it starts to get closer to the top. And that way you can perhaps see what it is that is causing the problem. I hope that helps. That's what I'd do anyway. All right. We've got Toot on board in Texas. Uh, nice to have you with us, Toot. All right. Also, we've got Zatagado. Welcome on board. Great to have you with us. Uh, who says, I really enjoy your content. Thank you very much. Uh, I have a small track 14 catamaran. For one season and I'm a new sailor. All right. Great stuff. I've had trouble completing an attack without stalling. Any advice? What do you think, Joyrider TV community? Any advice? I think so. All right. So we haven't, in fact, we haven't talked about tacking for quite a while now. So let's talk about tacking the fundamentals of the tack. Um, the first and most important thing to keep in mind when you're tacking is what are you doing with the main sheet? This is going to be our primary focus, the main sheet. If you get it right with the main sheet, then that should put everything else in the right. Uh, that should make it all happen for you. And you'll be going through the wind like you don't know how you ever didn't manage to do it before. If that makes any sense. So um, if this is the wind. Here's the procedure. First part of the procedure. Get the boat sailing as close to the wind as possible. So the way that we would do that would be um, to pull if uh, if you've got, a, I don't know if the track 14 has a jib, but 
if you've got a jib on the boat, pull the jib in tight, sail the boat up towards the wind just until the front part of the jib starts to flap a little bit and then just back it off just a touch until it fills. And that's how you know how close you can sail to the wind, generally speaking. So make sure you are sailing as close to the wind as possible, because um, what we want to do is reduce the angle that we have to turn the boat. Because with the catamaran, the bigger the angle is that we're turning, the more we are going to slow down and stop. So if we start the tack from like here, then chances are by the time we're pointing into the wind, we'll have lost all of our inertia and we will actually stop the turn and you'll stall. So get the boat sailing as close to the wind as possible. All right. So there is a great myth that says to succeed in the attack on a catamaran, you have to be going into it fast. This is absolute non-truth. Um, this is um, this is not true at all. What is most important is that you're sailing as close to the wind as possible. Now, when you're sailing as wind as possible. Next step is you want to have the main sheet cranked in as hard as it will go. Uh, because what that is going to do is let's have a bigger boat. Main sheet in tight. Let's say the pivot point on the boat is around here. By pulling in the main sheet tight, what it's doing is putting, change of colour please, um, is putting pressure behind the pivot point. So if you imagine that is where the boat is going to pivot. So by putting pressure behind the pivot point, it's going to really help to turn the boat into the wind. Very important. So crank the main sheet in as tight as it will go and then you're ready to initiate your turn. So push the rudders away. And as soon as the boat is pointing directly into the wind, then very important stage two with the main sheet is let the main sheet off. The more you let the main sheet off, the greater your chances of success are going to be. Because like with pulling it in tight, is going to put you head to wind. If you don't let it off, the boat isn't going to be allowed to turn away from the wind. So as soon as you head to wind, main sheet completely loose. Uh, as you get more used to tacking and you're refining your tacks, then you don't need to let off as much main sheet. But to start with, if you're worried about stalling, let off a load of main sheet and that is going to help the boat to turn away from the wind on the other side. So just to summarise all that, stage one, sail the boat as close to the wind as possible. Stage two, crank the main sheet in as tight as it will go. Stage three, initiate the turn. When you head to wind, let the main sheet off. And at this point, when you head to wind, what you need to focus on, as well as letting the main sheet off, is keeping the rudder angle the same to take you through. It's very easy to allow the rudders to turn the other way for a second. If you let them turn the other way from the sec for a second, then that could help, that could make you stall, even if you've done everything else. So f uh, keep an eye on the angle of your rudders all the way through. There we go. Hope that helps. It should do. Um, all right. Lau says, a question about telltales. I get the bottom telltale to fly quite easily. Sometimes I struggle to fly the top telltales um, as well, especially on the main and light winds. How can I improve this? Yeah, that's a, 
a tr- uh, is a bit of a tricky one. Um, so, can we see that? All right. Yes, we can. If this is our main sale, um, so the lower down ones, sorry, I stro- um, get the bottom ones to fly quite easily. So if we've got a telltale here, and but the top one doesn't fly straight back. If we're talking about the windward telltales, the ones that we can see on this side of the sail, um, it is always going to be that getting the bottom telltales flying straight back sooner is always going to be the way. So because, hold on. There's the boom. There's the main sheet there. Um, because what happens is when we pull the main sheet in here, this is going to affect the bottom of the sail very directly. So the main sheet coming in is going to get that bottom telltale uh, flying a lot sooner straight back than the top one. Because what we're always going to have to some degree is what we call twist in the sail, where the bottom of the sail is in and then the top of the sail is more open. Uh, twisting with your hand is difficult. Um, so the top of the sail open bottom of the sail closed. This is perfectly normal. And this is actually quite a healthy way to keep your sail because what you never want is the top of the sail to be uh, oversheeted. So if, if we had the windward telltale flying straight back at the top, we'd really be, you know, that is really efficient until it's not. So it's much more um, of a knife edge kind of place to have the sail is with the top of the sail in as tight as it the wind would telltale says it should be because it can go from being just right to oversheeted very easily. Whereas if we've got this inside telltale at the top lifting slightly, it means we have got that margin for a wind shift for a gust, which means we're not going to be oversheeted at any part. There we go. Um, but if we did want to close it, what could we do? Um, basically, we could sheet in the mainsail more. But then what we de- kind of depends on your sail a bit. But what could happen is then we could be oversheeting the bottom part of the sail. So what can we do? We can change this a bit with the down. So this would generally be a byproduct of having the downhaul on tighter because as we tighten the downhaul, it's going to open the top of the sail more earlier, um, which is going to have this effect. And like if we've got a middle telltale as well, maybe that's somewhere in between like that. Um, so having the downhaul on more is going to open up the top of the sail more. So by having less downhaul on, it's going to uh, open the top of the sail less. But what happens a lot if you're sailing when it's windy is it's going to be you're hardly ever going to be able to get that top tail telltale flying straight back because you just are going to be too overpowered to close that part of the sail. There we go. I think that pretty much covers it. The other thing we could look at if we were really into it, like if you were going to sail in the Olympic Games, uh, you could look at balancing all of your batten weights in the sail. So all of the battens in the sail have the same curve characteristics. This is going to get us to have a slightly more even curve in the sail, which means the whole sail will be acting slightly more uniform, uh, uniformly, if that's a word. Yeah, so that is what we could do there. I hope that helps. All right, Declan says, 
I heard Martin Malczewski, the King of Carbon, in the house. Oh, yes. Uh, it's always an honour to have the King with us. Uh, Declan says, as you know, we speed stickers are looking for any edge to beat the Swiss knackers. Um, have you ever thought of any other parts that could be swapped out for carbon parts? Yes. What I... This this would be an absolute dream, but on um, any boat uh, to have a tapered carbon mast like we have on the Tornado, I think this would really make a massive difference to the potential boat speed on that boat. So tapered carbon mast. Yes, please. What's next? Carbon beams. Could I have carbon beams for my tornado, please? No, they'd be too expensive and they'd probably break. Um, but yes, please. It's like the um, if you've come across the type of boat called the Flying Phantom, those boats three metres wide with carbon mast and carbon beams. So they're very, very light. Whereas with a tornado, if you pick up the front beam of a tornado, you go, Phew, that is pretty heavy. Um, you could probably save 10 kilos of weight with a carb with carbon beams on a tornado. But a carbon mast on a Hobie 16, then we would be seriously cooking. Once we'd worked out what the section should be, that kind of thing. Yeah, cooking. All right. Uh, David says, you look great. Thank you very much, David. I think that is probably in response to the, the new lighting. Um, so, yeah, what, what more do you need to see? Um, all right, Declan says, carbon mask, Dyneema rigging. Where else would you be looking to shed weight? Yeah, I think we've pretty much done it there. Um, unless you could get your holes made, a new set of holes made, which are ultra lightweight. But if you're talking um for the getaway specifically it is necessary speed stick rules say for it to qualify as a getaway you have to keep the holes and the mast the same that is all holes mast the same everything else can be different um but lose the wings uh lose the trampoline at the front for the top speed um, and just make sure your rudders are absolutely crisp. All right. Very good. So just scrolling back. Lot today in the live chat. Thanks for coming, everybody. It's very nice to have you all here. All right. Ryan is on board. Hello, Ryan in uh, Maui, Hawaii, USA. Um, so, and Declan says straight away, if Ryan beats me on the speed stick, I will buy a second black and yellow Malcheski. However, if I win, then can you make a green, white and orange version for all the Irish in the house? Oh, yes. Nice. And I did see that uh, Martin uh, from Malcheski Composite said we can supply a variety of colours. So I think that means whatever colours you want your tiller extension to be, Martin can do it. If you haven't checked it out yet, do check out his website where it got, if you go to his website, it's a dangerous game. If you've been told, no, you can't spend any more money on your boat because it's going to suck you in. Um, and Martin has got uh, distributors in Europe and I should think everywhere else in the world. So you don't have to get the stick shipped from the USA unless you want that Irish special, of course. All right, we've got Joaquin on board in Argentina, I believe. Great to have you with us. We are hitting the corners of the planet once again. This is part of the fun for me, just to see what parts of the world we can be hitting. So thanks everybody for tuning in. All right, we've got Hemmings Detail on board. Hello. Uh, who says, I have a two-hole tang. Do the shrouds and the trap wires go in the same hole? Um, 
on the same shackle or in different holes. Yeah, what I would do, and this is how the new boats are, is if you've got a two-hole tang, I would put the shrouds and the forestay in the lower hole and then the trapeze wires in the higher up hole. There we go. On the Hobie 16, yeah, perfect. All right, toots in with some elevator music. Must have caught me in the lift. All right, Valentin says, thanks for the tips. I will try that. Great stuff. Uh, we got Ed on board from Williamsburg. We've got Fawn G in with a question. In fact, before we go with Fawn G's question, I'm just going to take a short commercial break. Mm. It tastes so much better from a Joyrider TV bottle available at totaljoyrider.com. Thank you very much. Okay, and back to Fawn G's question. It says, when the boat is inverted, can the top of the mast get stuck in sandy ground rocks or water case? Wa sorry, water plants. And what do we do if that happens? All right, this is a fine question, Fawn G. This does happen from time to time. Um, there's our boat upside down and um, here is our bottom like this and yes it can happen that the top of your mast when it's upside down it can go into the bottom now if it's a sandy bottom it shouldn't be too much of an issue but if it's mud mud is the worst because well mud's not the worst pointy rocks would be the worst because you could really you could rip your sail if there was pointy rocks but um if it's mud, it's bad because you can really get your mast stuck in the mud because mud, which is on the seabed, is very, very sticky and it doesn't like to release your mast very easily. And it also can stain your sail. So this is this can be a real issue. Um, so. What can we do? First thing is. If we capsize and we know that the depth of the water isn't enough for the mast from our previous experience of capsizing there, then there should be a real sense of urgency when the boat is on the side to get on the writing line and try to stop it from inverting if we can. Because whatever your seabed is made of, you don't want the bottom of the, the mast going into the seabed because it could bend the mast like if um one of the worst scenario well the scenario which is really going to cause us the most problems is sorry let's have some water just for context is if the boat is capsized there and the wind is blowing this way, what that's going to be doing, the wind's going to be blowing onto the, the bottom of the trampoline and trying to push uh, the boat upside down more and at the same time driving the mast more into the bottom. Um, we are not going to be able to pull the boat upright from this position. So what do we do? If we are in this position, you know, we can try to get on the right in line as soon as possible to stop the boat from inverting. But if we haven't stopped the boat inverting, what do we do? What we need to do is go to either the front or the back of the hull, which is in the water. What that is going to do is we're going to roll the boat over. And generally, Getting onto the front of the boat is desirable, but if you go to the front of the boat, 
and nothing is happening, then the only thing you can do is then to go to the back of the boat, have the writing line to help you with stability, go right to the back of the hull. And then usually the back of the hulls don't have a lot of volume. So it can be quite easy to kind of roll the boat over. And then if you roll the boat over nine times out of 10, that will turn the boat enough so that then the wind stops driving the mast downwards and you will get free. Because what we want is without having to redraw the whole thing is to turn the boat enough so that the wind is then blowing onto the top of the trampoline. And by doing that, that is going to blow the mast off the bottom of the boat. But certainly what we don't want to do if the mast's on the bottom is to lean in and put more weight on it. So we really want to be getting our body weight out a bit to try to get the mast off the bottom. There we go. Good question there. All right. Declan says I have to leave, but we'll watch on demand later. Wishing everyone a wonderful weekend. Great to have you with us. And I uh, hope that that um, winter comes to an end soon so we can see you on the stick. All right. Ryan says uh, I'm enjoying the server. I'm a newbie to Discord, but I like it. Very good. All right. Joachim says 20 plus knots and crew couldn't make it. OK, gotcha. All right. We've got Philip, Philip on board. Hello, Philip. Uh, great to have you with us. Hello, ladies, says Philip, just in case there's any ladies uh, with us. He's um, always happy to greet the ladies. Uh, Zatago says, thanks very much. Great stuff. We've got Paul on board, Northern Italy. Hello, Paul. Nice to have you with us. Uh, you may have seen we've now got a fleet of these World Championships Hobie 16s in the boat park, just waiting for your arrival. Um, very exciting. Oh, yes. Can't wait to get out on those bad boys. All right. Who else we got? Oh, we've got Nova Cat Catamaran on board. Now, um, Nova Cat Catamaran, uh, you will remember if you saw the episode of Show Us Your Cat, um, he built a 16 foot uh, catamaran, absolutely spectacular. And I believe there is a unique opportunity to buy a 17 foot Nova Cat. There's going to be more information coming um, on this soon. But these boats are not mass produced. They're produced in very small numbers, extremely limited edition, very sought after. And there is a 17 foot version uh, available. Oh, yes. Um, I'll be I'll probably put out a short video about that uh, when I have a minute. All right. We've got. Oh, this is going to be bad pronunciation on my phone. Uh, Guillaume in France. Great to have you with us. Hello. Can't wait to sail next summer in Brittany on HB. Great stuff. And he also says, been watching your videos for a few months. Have only a few hours of Hobie 15, but ready to train more. Thanks to you. All right. Great stuff. Sorry about uh, pronouncing your name badly, uh, but I, I'm. It's one thing I'm good at is bad pronunciation. All right. Flip is on board. Hello, Flip. Uh, he says hello. Greetings from Tornado Sailor in Hamburg. Uh, they've all, Flip has already got the Malcheski composite uh, carbon rudder uh, enhancement, he calls it. Yeah, I've got that as well. And it works absolutely brilliantly. Uh, Flip says thanks for the tip provided last year. Great stuff. Glad that you got on board with that. I think it re before we fitted the Malcheski composite carbon rudder um, enhancement. I think that's a nice name for it. Um, our boat was looking shocking and it really did transform the rudder system. Great stuff. 
All right, Toot says, I completely destroyed a NACRA 5.2 from a turtle inversion in a storm. Yeah, so this is a real danger to your materials. All right, we've got Mark and Janet on board in Ohio. Great to have you with us as always. Leland, Leland Lee is with us as well from Clearwater, Florida. Nice to have you with us. Uh, Ryan suggests, this is a suggestion from Ryan and it's a good one. Hit the like button uh, and enjoy the weekend. Hashtag let's fly. Oh yeah. All right. Uh, Philip says, is there anybody on here living in Ireland? So if you're living in Ireland, do get involved and uh, let us let us know. All right. So uh, Christian is helping with um, some pronunciation. Uh, Giom. Giom. All right. He says, salut. Uh, OK, so um, I'm just going to go on to some preloaded questions now. Uh, I think that's about that time to do that. So just having a look. So uh, one from Franklin, um, who asks, is it possible to launch a Hobie 16 or I'd say any other type of small catamaran from a boat dock or marina? Now, this it is possible, yes, but it takes some certain seamanship skills to be able to do it because it really depends on the amount of space that you have, the direction of the wind, uh, how strong the wind is, things like that. Um, so as we know, the wind here always blows from the top. So. Um, Quite a straightforward one, you'd think, would be if, um, cool, there's so many options. If this is the ramp where you put your boat in the water, and here is, let's call it the dock, and perhaps there's moored yachts here and here. Yeah, this could this could get quite emotional quite quickly. So um, here's where the water starts. And this is where the exit is down here, where you want to get to. This is open sea down here. Mm. Yeah. So what would be the way to sail, launch your boat here and get it out without having an absolute disaster? Let's look at what the options might be. Option number one, put the boat in the water. It will be like this. Let's hope that this is the sort of scale that we're looking at. And then try to turn the boat enough so that then you can just sail straight downwind nicely. That would be a possibility if the wind was very light. But what could happen? if the wind wasn't very light, is once you get to here, the boat will power up um, and you might find yourself unable to turn quickly enough to avoid hitting one of these boats. This is going to be a really poor situation. So if we say that is not the best solution, solution number two, We'll have the boat in the water like this rigged, perhaps better with the boat in the middle. The wind is in this direction. And then what we could do is sail out backwards. OK, this is quite a high. Um, it's a commitment strategy to sail out backwards. But if the wind is completely straight through these boats and it isn't for too long, then we can sit on the bows of the boats um, to get the bows to dig in. This is going to keep it straight. And then the boat should sail straight downwind backwards. 
pretty um, high commitment here. So again, not the best solution. So you may ask, what do you feel is the best solution in this situation? I would say to sail out with the main sail down. So just to sail out with the jib up and you'd then be able to hold the boat pointing in the right direction. You'd have enough way on with the jib. Out you go. Um, and then the ideal would then be just on the jib to find somewhere like a beach nearby where you can pull the boat up, put the mainsail up there and then off you go from there. Or the alternative is, of course, having to hoist the mainsail while you're afloat, which can be a bit of a challenge. There you go. Um, so I see Christian has asked, what if there's no ramp at all? Yeah, then, then it starts getting tricky. In fact, where we had the Tornado World Championships twice now in Thessaloniki, Greece, um, we had that sort of situation where there's not a ramp, but in fact, there's a floating pontoon. Here's the pontoon. It's a, it's a really, it's probably the most difficult launch that I've had to do more than once. Um, there's the sea level there. So what we do is reverse the boat. So we've got the wheels and we get the wheels almost to the edge. And then when we get to the edge, it might be to the end or it might be to the side. Then we lift the front of the boat up as high as we possibly can so that the back of the boat starts floating. And then we kind of float the boat off the wheels, making sure that we don't drop the wheels in the water because we'll never get them back again. Um, and then we'll just let the boat slide into the water from there and then hold it in such a way that it's getting blown away from the pontoon more. So we're not going to damage the boat. But this was a very tricky launching situation because with the tornado, it was actually that the this jetty was wide enough for the wheels of the trolley, but no extra width five aside. So the hulls of the boat were actually outside of the jetty. Probably the most tricky launch I've known. So there we go. I hope that helps, Frederick. So yes, it can be done. Yes, it's tricky, uh, but it can be done. So there we go. All right. Thanks very much to Thorn G, uh, who has just presented the first super sticker of the session. Super sticker, if you didn't know, is a great way of just showing your appreciation for all of this high quality information that's been coming your way. Um, you'll find it just at the bottom of the live chat interface. Could you say interface there? All right, so we've got Ebby on board. Greetings from Germany, great stuff. Once more, thanks for the tiger buying guide video. Cool. I'm glad that helped. I particularly enjoyed doing that video. Um, I'm a, if you didn't know, I, my main class of boat for competition over the years has been the Hobie Tiger. Um, and I only changed the tornado since Hobie basically gave up on the Hobie Tiger. Um, and there was no more events for the Hobie Tiger in Europe. So um, the tornado was the obvious choice for me uh, there. So there you go. Um, finally picked up a 2003 beauty last weekend, waiting with a lot of respect to take her out for the first time in May. Great stuff. I'm really excited for you. And um, I really hope that you and your tiger are going to have a lot of good times. And Ebby continues, one question, any advice for helmets on the cat? Yes. Yeah, so what uh, my personal philosophy is 
if I feel that there is a good chance that you're going to capsize, uh, then you should put a helmet on, I think. if So for me, that means if the wind is above like, I don't know, 25 knots, then I'm going to put my helmet on. I also, of course, use the helmet for filming, which is quite handy. But um, I'll put it on because I've had concussion before. It was a really bad time. It's really unpleasant and it could have been a lot worse, I know. So I would rather put the helmet on and um, there you are. And then, you know. So for others, the sort of when do you think there's a strong chance of capsizing threshold in the wind? It's going to be a bit lower, maybe 15 knots. That's a good time to put a um, a helmet on. Um, yeah, so it is personal preference, but it really gives it gives you a lot more confidence having a helmet on, keeps the sun off your head, and it can avoid a pretty bad injury if you were to capsize. Because when you capsize, you don't always have the choice of where it is that you're going to end up. Worst place to end up is back of the head onto the mast or going off the hull and landing on the lower hull on your head. So if you've got a helmet on, that can make all the difference. Um, I use, personally, I use a Mystic helmet. I don't know what the model is called. Uh, Johan66 says the Magic Marine Impact Pro helmet. Uh, incidentally, Magic Marine and Mystic are the same company. Magic Marine is the sailing branch. Mystic is the kite surfing wakeboarding and windsurfing branch so it's probably the same helmet i would guess yeah so yes to the helmet good idea all right thanks very much to mark who has just joined the joyrider sailing club um channel membership uh thanks for getting on board and he's uh also hit me with a super sticker mark thanks very much i'm uh guessing that you are Oh, number one fan, it says. Great stuff. Thanks for getting on board. All right. Novacat Catamaran says, uh, all of the boats, all self-build builders or whoever would like to build a boat themselves are welcome. Yes. Yeah, so Novacat Catamaran, you can, they can supply the plans so you can build your own boat. This is very cool. Um, do check out that episode of Show Us Your Cat. You'll know it because it's got the blue, very nice looking boat on the thumbnail picture. Very nice indeed. All right. So we are going to our next preloaded question, which is, oh, this, I really like this question. I think this was, um, I, I can't remember where this question came from. But it's, it's Christopher. He says, what is the minimum you recommend in order to have a little fun? Enough to make taking the cat out worth the effort. So this would be a wind strength thing. Um, yeah. Now, what is the effort involved in taking your catamaran out for a sail? Biggest effort once you're actually at the venue uh, where you're going to go sailing is probably wheeling the boat into the water. Depends on the nature of your launch. If you're going sailing in this um, marina, yeah, that's quite an effort. Uh, but if you've got a nice sloping beach, not too much effort at all. Um, so the biggest part of the effort, I would say, is launching the boat and then pulling it out of the water afterwards. Uh, second biggest part of the effort is, of course, going to be putting the sails up. But like um, I've said in videos, make the sail, make putting the sails up a lot easier by, by getting them wet before pulling them up. If you're lucky enough to, of the main sail in the water, get it 
really wet before um, or if you're not sailing in fresh water if you can get the hose on the sail give it a wash before hoisting it much easier but then back to the point what is the smallest pen so you go in sailing with of course if it is a lifelong friend perhaps your wife um you might need a bit more with no joking of course um but things start to get fun at around in terms of performance i would say at about eight to ten knots of wind that is when the boat will start to lift the hull slightly um and you'll start to really get the boat moving nicely so i would say that would be the bottom end for getting some performance out of your boat you could perhaps visit a nearby beach or just go for a nice sail look at the fish do some fishing um that kind of thing so it really does depend on what your expectations are uh when you go out sailing uh, it's a great question, that, Christopher. I hope that was a good enough answer. Thank you very much. All right, we've got Madusa the second. Big question. Does Wild Wind do holidays? Oh, yes. Just check out wildwind.co.uk. Boom. Uh, yeah, just head over to the website and you'll be able to see exactly what we do over there. Uh, what we do mainly is like package holidays where we supply the flights. Uh, we've got hotels right on the beach next to the boat park. And we so we do the flights, the accommodation and as much sailing as you can shake a stick at. Um, that is what we generally do. But then as well as that, we can do packages, which is just the accommodation and the sailing very nice or we could do just the sailing if you want to get your own accommodation uh we could do by the hour by half a day or by the week stuff like that and it is philip asks all inclusive no that is something that we don't do so um all the food and drinks you have to pay for uh, on top of the price of the holiday uh, because with it being sailors coming out, we know that they're going to be uh, the drinks bill is going to be high. Generally, there we go. Uh, Medusa the second says, "What's the best time of year to come to Vasiliki?" I would say, if if you're not coming out with your family with kids, best time to come out would be end of June, start of July. For me, that really is the best time because by that point, the water has warmed up significantly. So um, you can go sailing in shorts, no need for a wetsuit. Um, and it's before it gets too busy. Uh, it doesn't ever get too busy, but it's while it's still pretty quiet, you've got more space on the water before lots of yachts are coming in um so that i would say is the real sweet spot but if you didn't catch the start of this transmission um i announced that 16th of july week we are hosting the joyrider tv festival of speed at wildwind sailing holidays uh where it's going to be like a special speed week where you're challenged to go as fast as you can on as many types of different boat as possible with a lot of other like-minded individuals. First time we're ever doing something like this. So that would be a very good time to come out. All right. So uh, Johan 66 says a bad light wind sailing day is always better than a good work in the office. There you go. Get out of the office, get out on the water. Yeah, getting out on the water, light winds, any conditions, therapy. It's good for you. All right, we've got Fred on board. Howdy, all. Great to have you with us, Fred. Um, but Fred has tuned in right where, well, 
Fred might have been here the whole time. Who knows? But um, yeah, I think that's about all we've got time for today. That's all of the questions um, discussed. Please hit the like button before you leave. Thanks again to Mark and to Form G for getting involved and supporting the channel uh, specifically today. Thanks to everybody else who's been supporting the channel um, on Patreon or through channel memberships or just by coming down to TotalJoyRider.com. Get yourself a glossary of terms. Top. Uh, Nova Cat Marine just says, sailing fast uh, in light wind sitting on the leeward hull is also pretty fun. Yeah, once it's windy enough to uh, fly the hull, then for me, that's when it starts to cook. Uh, Fred says, but they get sailing just might be the push I needed today. Nice. All right. If you can get out on the water this weekend or even today, then take uh, get on the stick. Let's get on the stick. Thanks, Philip. Uh, uh, I'd say that is a pint. You've just got me and I will take that pint and I will enjoy it. Thanks very much. Thanks to everybody. And I'll see you. Hopefully I'll have this video really exciting Sunday comparing the new global standard Hobie 16 to the older version of the boat, which we're used to. I'll be looking at all the differences on the boat. Whether I think they're good, uh, we'll take it from there. So that hopefully should be out usual time on Sunday. Thanks for tuning in and thanks for tuning in. Have a great weekend. Thanks for tuning in. See you later. Thank you.